deep work rule number 2 embrace boredom to better understand how one masters the art of deep work i suggest visiting the nessus israel synagogue in spring valley new york at 6 am on a weekday morning if you do you will likely find at least 20 cars in a parking lot inside you will encounter a couple dozen members of the congregation working over text some might be reading silently mouthing the words of an ancient language while others are packed to the debating at one end of the room a rabbi will be leading a larger group in a discussion this early morning gathering in spring valley represents just a small fraction of the hundreds of thousands of orthodox jews who will wake up early that morning as they do every weekday morning to practice a central tenet of their faith to spend time every day studying the complex written traditions of rabbinic judaism i was introduced to this world by adam merlin a member of the nessus israel congregation and one of the regulars at its morning study group as merlin explained to me his goal with this practice is to decipher one talmud page each day often working with the chevruta to push his understanding closer to his cognitive limit what interests me about marlin is not his knowledge of ancient texts but instead the type of effort required to gain this knowledge when i interviewed him he emphasized the mental intensity of his morning ritual it's an extreme and serious discipline consisting mostly of the deep work stuff he explained i run a growing business but this is often the orders to brain train i do this train is not unique to marlin but is instead ingrained in the practice as his rabbi once explained to him you cannot consider yourself as fulfilling this daily obligation unless you have stretched to the reaches of your mental capacity unlike many orthodox jews morlin came late to his faith not starting his rigorous talmud training until his 20s this bit of trivia proves useful to her purposes because it allows morlin a clear before and after comparison concerning the impact of this mental calisthenics and the result surprised him though morlin was exceptionally well educated when he began the practice he holds three different ivy league ad- degrees he soon met fellow adherents who had only ever attended small religious schools but could still dance intellectual circles around him a number of these people were highly successful he explained to me but it wasn't some fancy school that pushed their intellect higher it became clear it was instead their daily study that started as early as the 5th day after a while molin began to notice positive changes in his own ability to think deeply i've recently been making more highly creative insight in my business school he told me i'm convinced it's related to this daily mental practice this consistent strain has built my mental muscle over years and years this was not the goal when i started but it's the effect Adam Merlin's experience underscores an important reality about deep work. The ability to concentrate intensely is a skill that must be trained. This idea might sound obvious once it's pointed out, but it represents a departure from how most people understand such matters. In my experience, it's common to treat undistracted concentration as a habit like flossing, something that you know how to do and know is good for you. But that you have been neglecting due to lack of motivation this mindset is appealing because it implies you can transform your working life from distracted to focused to overnight if you can simply muster enough motivation but this understanding ignores the difficulty of focus and the hours of practice necessary to strengthen your mental muscle the creative insights that adam marlin now experiences in his professional life in other words have little to do with a one time decision to think deeper and much to do with the commitment to training his ability early every morning that is however an important corollary to this idea efforts to deepen your focus will struggle if you don't simultaneously wean your mind from a dependence on distraction much is in the same way that athletes must take care of their bodies outside of the training sessions you will struggle to achieve the deepest level of concentration if you spend the rest of your time freeing the slightest hint of boredom We can find evidence for this claim in the research of Clifford Nash, the late Stanford communications professor, who was well known for his study of behavior in the digital age. Among other insights, Nash's research revealed that constant attention switching online has a lasting negative effect on your brain. 
Yes, Nash summarizing these findings in a 2010 interview with NPR's Era Flato. So we have scales that allow us to divide up people into people who multitask all the time and people who rarely do, and the difference are remarkable. People who multitask all the time can't filter out irrelevancy. They cannot manage their working memory. They are chronically distracted. They initiate much larger parts of their brain that are irre- irrelevant to the task at the end. They are pretty much mental wrecks. At this point, Flatter asked Nas whether the chronically distracted recognize this rewiring of their brain. The people we talk with continually said, "Look, when I really have to concentrate, I turn off everything and I'm laser focused." And unfortunately, they have developed habits of mind and that make it impossible for them to be laser focused. They are suckers for irrelevancy. They just can't keep on task. Once your brain has become accustomed to on-demand distraction, Nas discovered it's hard to shake the addiction even when you want to concentrate. To put this more concretely, if every moment of potential boredom in your life, say having to wait five minutes in line or sit alone in a restaurant until a friend arrives, is relieved with a quick glance at your smartphone, then your brain has likely been rewired to a point where, like the mental wrecks in Nas research. It's not ready for deep work, even if you regularly schedule time to practice this concentration. Rule number one: taught you how to integrate deep work into your schedule and support it with your routines and rituals designed to help you consistently reach the current limits of your concentration ability. Rule number two will help you significantly improve this limit. The strategies that follow are motivated by the key idea that getting the most out of your deep work habit requires training. and as clarified previously this training must address two goals improving your ability to concentrate intensely and overcoming your desire for distraction these strategies cover a variety of approaches from quarantining distraction to mastering a special form of meditation that combine to provide a practical road map for your journey from a mind wrecked by constant distraction and unfamiliar with concentration to an instrument that truly does deliver laser like focus don't take breaks from distraction instead take breaks from focus many assume that they can switch between a state of distraction and one of concentration as needed but as i just argued this assumption is optimistic once you are wired for distraction you crave it Motivated by this reality, this strategy is designed to help you rewire your brain to your configuration better suited to staying on task. Before diving into the details, let's start by considering a popular suggestion for distraction addiction that doesn't quite solve our problem: the internet sabbath. In its basic form, this ritual asks you to put aside regular time, typically one day a week, where you refrain from network technology. In the same way that the Sabbath in the Hebrew Bible induces a period of quiet and reflection well suited to appreciate God and his works, the internet Sabbath is meant to remind you of what you miss when you are glued to your screen. It's unclear who first introduced the internet Sabbath concept, but credit for popularizing the idea often goes to the journalist William Pass, who promoted the practice in his 2010 reflection on technology and human happiness, Hamlet's Blackberry. As Paul's letter summarizes in an interview, do what Thoreau did, which is learn to have a little disconnectedness within the connected world. Don't run away. A lot of advice for the problem of distraction follows this general template of finding occasional time to get away from the clutter. Some put aside one or two months a year to escape this tethers. Others follow Paul's one day a week advice, while others put aside an hour or two every day for the same purpose. all forms of this advice provide some benefit but once we see the distraction problem in terms of brain wiring it becomes clear that an internet sabbath cannot by itself cure a distracted brain if you eat healthy just one day a week you are unlikely to lose weight as the majority of your time is still spent gorging similarly if you spend just one day a week resisting distraction you are unlikely to diminish your brain's craving for this stimuli as most of your time is still spent giving in to it i propose an alternative to the internet sabbat instead of scheduling the occasional break from distraction so you can focus you should instead schedule the occasional break from focus to give an in to the distraction 
To make this suggestion more concrete, let's make this simplifying assumption that internet use is synonymous with seeking distracting stimuli. Similarly, let's consider working in the absence of the internet to, the, to be synonymous with more focused work. With this rough categorization established, the strategy works as follows. Schedule in advance when you will use the internet and then avoid it altogether outside these times. I suggest that you keep a notepad near your computer at work. On this pad, record the next time you are allowed to use the internet. Until you arrive at that time, absolutely no network connectivity is allowed, no matter how tempting. The idea of motivating this strategy is that the use of a distracting service does not by itself reduce your brain's ability to focus. It's instead the constant switching from low stimuli, high value activities to high stimuli, low value activities at the slightest hint of a boredom or cognitive challenge that teaches your mind to never tolerate an absence of novelty. This constant switching can be understood analogously as weakening the mental muscles responsible for organizing the many resources vying for your attention. By segregating internet use, you are minimizing the number of times you are given to a distraction and by doing so, you let this attention selecting muscles strengthen. For example, if you have scheduled your next internet block 30 minutes from the current moment and you are beginning to feel bored and crave distraction, the next 30 minutes of resistance become a session of concentration calisthenics. A full day of scheduled distraction therefore becomes a full day of similar mental training. While the basic idea behind this strategy is straightforward, putting it into practice can be tricky. To help you succeed, here are three important points to consider. Point number one. This strategy works even if your job requires lots of internet use and or prompt email replies. If you are required to spend hours every day online or answer emails quickly, that's fine. This simply means that your internet blocks will be more numerous than those of someone whose job requires less connectivity. The total number or duration of your internet blocks doesn't matter nearly as much as making sure that the integrity of your offline blocks remain intact. Imagine, for example, that over a two-hour period between meetings, you must schedule an email check every 15 minutes. Further imagine that these checks require on average 5 minutes. It's sufficient, therefore, to schedule an internet block every 15 minutes through this two-hour stretch, with the rest of the time dedicated to offline blocks. In this example, you will end up spending around 90 minutes out of this two-hour period in a state where you are offline and actively resisting destruction. This works out to be a large amount of concentration training that's achieved without requiring you to sacrifice too much connectivity. Point number two. Regardless of how you schedule your internet blocks, you must keep the time outside these blocks absolutely free from internet use. This objective is easy to state in principle but quickly becomes tricky in the messy reality of the standard workday. An inevitable issue you will face when executing this strategy is realizing early on in an offline blog that there is some crucial piece of information online that you need to retrieve to continue making progress on your current task. If your next internet blog doesn't start for a while, you might end up stuck. The temptation in this situation is to quickly give in, look up the information, then return to your offline blog. You must resist this temptation. The internet is seductive. You may think that you are just retrieving a single key email from your inbox, but you will find it odd to not glance at the other urgent messages that have recently arrived. It doesn't take many of these exceptions before your mind begins to treat the barrier between internet and offline blocks as permeable, diminishing the benefits of this strategy. It's crucial in this situation, therefore, that you don't immediately abandon an offline block even when stuck. If it's possible, switch to another offline activity for the remainder of the current block. If this is infeasible, perhaps you need to get the current offline activity done promptly. Then the correct response is to change your schedule so that your next internet block begins sooner. The key in making the change, however, is, not, is to not schedule the next internet block to occur immediately. Instead, enforce at least a 5-minute gap between the current moment and the next time you can go online. This gap is minor, so it won't excessively impede your progress, but from a behavioralistic perspective, it's substantial because it separates the sensation of wanting to go online from the reward of actually doing so. Point number three. 
Scheduling internet use at home as well as at work can further improve your concentration training. If you find yourself glued to a smartphone or laptop throughout your evenings and weekends, then it's likely that your behavior outside of work is undoing many of your attempts during the workday to rewire your brain. In this case, I would suggest that you maintain the strategy of scheduling internet use even after the workday is over. To simplify matters, when scheduling internet use after work, you can allow time-sensitive communication into your offline blocks, as well as build time-sensitive information retrieval. Outside of these pragmatic exceptions, however, when in an offline block, put your phone away, ignore text, and refrain from internet usage. As in the workplace variation of this strategy, if we, the internet plays a large and important role in your evening environment, that's fine. Schedule lots of long internet blocks. The key here isn't to avoid or even to reduce the total amount of time you spend engaging in distracting behavior, but is instead to give yourself plenty of opportunities throughout your evening to resist switching to these distractions at the slightest hint of boredom. One place where this strategy becomes particularly difficult outside work is when you are forced to wait. It's crucial in this situation that if you are in an offline block, you simply grid yourself for the temporary boredom and fight through it with only the company of your thoughts. To simply wait and be bored has become a novel experience in modern life, but from the perspective of concentration training, it's incredibly valuable. To summarize, to succeed with the deep work, you must rewire your brain to be comfortable resisting distracting stimuli. This doesn't mean that you have to eliminate distracting behaviors. It's sufficient that you instead eliminate the ability to, of such behaviors to hijack your attention. The simple strategy proposed here of scheduling internet blocks goes a long way toward helping you regain this attention autonomy. Work like Teddy Roosevelt if you attended Harvard College during the 1876-1877 school year, you would have likely noticed a wiry, mutton-chopped, brash and impossibly energetic freshman named Theodore Roosevelt. If you then proceeded to befriend this young man, you would have soon noticed a paradox. On the one hand, his attention might appear to be hopelessly scattered, spread over what one classmate called an amazing array of interest, a list that biographer Edmund Morris catalogs to contain boxing, wrestling, bodybuilding, dance lessons, poetry readings, and the continuation of a lifelong obsession with the naturalism. This later interest developed to the point that Roosevelt published his first book, The Summer Birds of Adirondacks. In the summer after his freshman year, it was well received in the bulletin of the Natal or Ornithological Club a publication, needless to say, which takes Bird's books quite seriously and was good enough to lead Morris to assess Roosevelt at this young age to be one of the most knowledgeable young naturalists in the United States. To support this extracurricular exuberance, Roosevelt had to severely restrict the time left available for what should have been his primary focus, his studies at Harvard. Morris used Roosevelt's diary and letters from this period to estimate that the future president was spending no more than a quarter of the typical day studying. One might expect, therefore, that Roosevelt's grades would crater, but they didn't. He wasn't the top student in his class, but he certainly didn't struggle either. In his freshman year, he earned honor grades in five out of his seven courses. The explanation for this Roosevelt paradox turns out to be his unique approach to tackling this school work. Roosevelt would begin his scheduling by considering the 8 hours from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. He would then remove this the time spent in recitation and classes, his athletic training, and lunch. The fragments that remained were then considered time, dedicated exclusively to studying. As noted, these fragments didn't usually add up to a large number of total hours, but you would get the most out of them by working only on schoolwork during these periods, and doing so with the blistering intensity. The amount of time he spent at his desk was comparatively small, explained Boris, but his concentration was so intense and his reading so rapid that he could afford more time off than most. This strategy ask you to inject the occasional dash of Roosevelt intensity into your own workday. In particular, identify a deep task that's eye on your priority list. Estimate 
how long you would normally put aside for an application of this type then give yourself yet odd deadline that drastically reduce this time if possible commit publicly to the deadline for example by telling the person expecting the finished project when they should expect it if this is impossible then motivate yourself by setting a countdown timer on your phone and propping it up where you cannot avoid seeing it as you work at this point there should be only one possible way to get the deep task done in time working with great intensity no email breaks no daydreaming no facebook browsing no repeated trips to the coffee machine like roosevelt at harvard attack the task with every free neuron until it gives way under your unwavering barrage of concentration try this experiment no more than once a week at first giving your brain practice with intensity but also giving it time to rest in between once you feel confident in your ability to trade concentration for completion time increase the frequency of this roosevelt dashes remember however to always keep your self imposed deadlines right at the edge of feasibility you should be able to consistently beat the buzzer but to do so should require teeth gritting concentration the main motivation for this strategy is straightforward deep work requires levels of concentration well behind where most knowledge workers are comfortable roosevelt's dashes leverage artificial deadlines to help you systematically increases the level you can regularly achieve providing in some sense interval training for the attention centers of your brain an additional benefit is that these dashes are incompatible with distraction therefore every completed dash provides a session in which you are potentially bored and really want to seek more novel stimuli but you resist as argued in the previous strategy the more you practice resisting such urges the easier such resistance becomes after a few months of deploying this strategy you understand your understanding of what it means to focus will likely be transformed as you reach levels of intensity stronger than anything you have experienced before and if you are anything like a young roosevelt you can then repurpose the extra free time it generates toward the finer pleasures in life like trying to impress the always discerning members of the nodal ornithological club meditated productively during the two years i spent as a post doctoral associate at mit my wife and i lived in a small but charming apartment on pinkney street in historic beacon hill though i lived in boston and worked in cambridge the two locations were close only a mile apart sitting on opposite banks of the charles river intent on staying fit even during the long and dark new england winter i decided to take advantage of this proximity by traveling between home and work to the greatest extent possible on foot my routine at me walk to campus in the morning crossing the long fellow bridge in all weather around lunch i would change into running gear and run back home on a longer path that followed the banks of the charles crossing at the mashashut avenue bridge after a quick lunch and shower at home I would typically take the subway across the river on the way back to campus and then walk home when the work day was done in other words i spent a lot of time on my feet during this period it was this reality that led me to develop the practice that i will now suggest you adopt in your own deep work training productive meditation the goal of productive meditation is to take a period in which you are occupied physically but not mentally walking jogging driving showering and focus your attention on a single well defined professional problem depending on your profession this problem might be outlining an article writing a talk making progress on a proof or attempting to sharpen a business strategy as in mindfulness meditation you must continue to bring your attention back to the problem at hand when it wanders or stalls I used to practice productive meditation in at least one of my daily cross river treks while living in Boston and as I improved so did my results I ended up for example working out the chapter outlines for a significant portion of my last book while on foot and made progress on many naughty technical problems in my academic research I suggest that you adopt a productive meditation practice in your own life you don't necessarily need a serious session every day but your goal should be to participate in at least two or three such sessions in typical week fortunately finding time for this strategy is easy as it takes advantage of periods that would otherwise be wasted and if done right
can actually increase your professional productivity instead of taking time away from your work. In fact, you might even consider scheduling your work during your work day specifically for the purpose of applying productive meditation to your most pressing problem at the moment. I am not, however, suggesting this practice for its productivity benefits. I am instead interested in its ability to rapidly improve your ability to think deeply. In my experience, productive meditation builds on both of the key ideas introduced at the beginning of this rule. By forcing you to resist distraction and return your attention repeatedly to a well-defined problem, it helps strengthen your distraction-resisting muscles and by forcing you to push your focus deeper and deeper on a single problem, it sharpens your concentration. To succeed with productive meditation, it's important to recognize that, like any form of meditation, it requires practice to do well. When I first attempted this strategy back in the early weeks of my postdoc, I found myself hopelessly distracted ending long stretches of thinking with little new to show for my efforts. It took me a dozen or so sessions before I began to experience real results. You should expect something similar so patience will be necessary. To help accelerate this ramp up process, however, I have two specific suggestions to offer. Suggestion number one, be wary of distractions and looping. As a novice, when you begin a productive meditation session, your mind's first act of rebellion will be to offer unrelated but seemingly more interesting thoughts. My mind, for example, was often successful at derailing my attention by beginning to compose an email that I knew I needed to write. Objectively speaking, this train of thought sounds uh, exceedingly dull, but in the moment it can become impossibly tantalizing. When you notice your attention slipping away from the problem at hand, gently remind yourself that you can return to that thought later, then redirect your attention back. Distraction of this type in many ways is the obvious enemy to defeat in developing a productive meditation habit. A subtler but equally effective adversary is looping. When faced with the odd problem, your mind, as it was evolved to do, will attempt to avoid excess expenditure of energy when possible. One way it might attempt to sidestep this expenditure is by avoiding diving deeper into the problem by instead looping over and over again on what you already know about it. For example, when working on a proof, my mind has a tendency to rehash simple preliminary results again and again to avoid the order work of building on these results toward the needed solution. You must be on your guard for looping as it can quickly subvert an entire productive meditation session. When you notice it, remark to yourself that you seem to be in a loop, then redirect your attention toward the next step. Suggestion number two, structure your deep thinking. Thinking deeply about your problem seems like a self-evident act activity, but in reality it's not. When faced with a distraction-free mental landscape, a hard problem and time to think, the next steps can become surprisingly non-obvious. In my experience, it helps to have some structure for this deep thinking process. I suggest starting with a careful review of the relevant variables of, for solving the problems and then storing these values in your working memory. For example, if you are working on the outline for a book chapter, the relevant variables might be the main points you want to make in the chapter. If you are instead trying to solve a mathematics proof, these variables might be actual variables or assumptions or lemmas. Once the relevant variables are identified, Define the specific next step question you need to answer using these variables. In the book chapter example, this next step question might be, how am I going to effectively open this chapter? And for a proof, it might be, what can go wrong if I don't assume this property holds? With the relevant variables stored and the next step question identified, you now have a specific target for your attention. Assuming you are able to solve your next step question. The final step of this structured approach to deep thinking is to consolidate your gains by reviewing clearly the answer you identified. At this point, you can push yourself to the next level of depth by starting the process over. This cycle of reviewing and storing variables, identifying and tackling the next step question, then consolidating your gains is like an intense workout routine for your concentration ability. It will help you get more out of your productive meditative sessions and accelerate the phase at which you improve your ability to go deep. Memory is a deck of cards. 
Given just five minutes, Daniel Kilo can memorize any of the following: a shuffle deck of chords, a string of one hundred random digits, or one hundred and fifteen abstract shapes. This last feat establishing an Australian national record. It should be surprising, therefore, that Kilo recently won back-to-back -back silver medals in the Australian Memory Championships. What is perhaps surprising, given Kilo's history, is that he ended up a mental athlete at all. I wasn't born with an exceptional memory, Kilo told me. Indeed, during high school, he considered himself forgetful and disorganized. He also struggled academically and was eventually diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. It was after a chance encounter with the Tansal Hali, one of the country's most successful and visible memory champions, that Kilo began to seriously train his memory. By the time he earned his college degree, he had won his first national competition medal. This transformation into a world-class mental athlete was rapid but not unprecedented. In 2006, the American science writer Joshua Foyer won the USA Memory Championship after only a year of intense training. A journey he chronicled in his 2011 bestseller, Moonwalking with Einstein. But what's important to us about Kilo's story is what happened to his academic performance during this period of intensive memory development. While training his brain, he went from a struggling student with attention deficit disorder to graduating from a demanding Australian university with first class honors. He was soon accepted into the PhD program at one of the country's top universities, where he currently studies under a renowned philosopher. One explanation for this transformation comes from research led by Henry Rodiger, who runs the memory lab at the University of Washington in St. Louis. In 2014, Rodiger and his collaborators sent a team equipped with a battery of cognitive tests to the extreme memory tournament held in San Diego. They wanted to understand what differentiated these elite memorizers from the population at large. We found that one of the biggest difference between memory athletes and the rest of us is in a cognitive ability that's not a direct measure of memory at all, but of attention, explained Rodiger in the New York Times blog post. The ability in question is called attention control and it measures the subject's ability to maintain their focus on essential information. A side effect of memory training, in other words, is an improvement in your general ability to concentrate. This ability can then be fruitfully applied to any task demanding deep work. Daniel Kilo, we can therefore conjecture, didn't become a star student because of his award-winning memory. It was instead his quest to improve this memory that gave him the deep work edge needed to thrive academically. The strategy described here asks you to replicate a key piece of Kilo's training and therefore gain some of the same improvements to your concentration. In particular, it asks you to learn a standard but quite impressive skill in the repertoire of most mental athletes, the ability to memorize the shuffle deck of chords. The technique for chord memorization I will teach you comes from someone who knows quite a bit about this particular challenge, Ron White, a former USA memory champion and world record holder in chord memorization. The first thing White emphasizes is that professional memory athletes never attempt rote memorization. That is, where you simply look at information again and again, repeating it in your head. This approach to retention, though popular among burned out students, misunderstand how our brain works. We are not wired to quickly internalize abstract information. We are, however, really good at remembering scenes. Think back to a recent memorable event in your life. Perhaps attending the opening session of a conference or meeting a friend you haven't seen in a while for a drink. Trying to picture the scheme as clearly as possible. Most people in this scenario can conjure a surprisingly vivid recollection of the event even though you made no special effort to remember it at the time. If you systematically counted the unique details in this memory, the total number of items would likely be surprisingly numerous. Your mind, in other words, can quickly retain lots of detailed information if it's stored in the right way. Ron White's card memorization technique builds on this insight. To prepare for this high volume memorization task, White recommends that you begin by cementing in your mind the mental image of walking through five rooms in your room. Perhaps you come in the door, walk through your front hallway, then turn into the downstairs bathroom. 
walk out the door and enter the guest bedroom. Walk into the kitchen and then head down the stairs into your basement. In each room, conjure a clear image of what you see. Once you can easily recall this mental walkthrough of a well-known location, fix in your mind a collection of 10 items in each of these rooms. White recommends that these items be large, like a desk, not a pencil. Next, establish an order in which you look at each of these items in each room. For example, in the front hallway, you might look at the entry mat, then shoes on the floor by the mat, then the benches above the shoes, and so on. Combine this is only 50 items. So add two more items, perhaps in your backyard, to get to the full 52 items you will later need when connecting these images to all the cards in a standard deck. Practice this mental exercise of walking through the rooms and looking at items in each room in a set order. You should find that this type of memorization, because it's based on visual images of familiar places and things, will be much easier than the rote memorizing you might remember from your school days. The second step in preparing to memorize a deck of cards is to associate a memorable person or thing with each of the 52 possible cards. To make this process easier, try to maintain some logical association between the card and the corresponding image. White provides the example of associating Donald Trump with the King of Diamonds as diamonds signify wealth. Practice these associations until you can pull a card randomly from the deck and immediately recall the associated image. As before, the use of memorable visual images and associations will simplify the task of forming these connections. The two steps mentioned previously are advanced steps. Things you do just once and can then leverage again and again in memorizing specific decks. Once these steps are done, you are ready for the main event. Memorizing as quickly as possible the order of 52 cards in a freshly shuffled deck. The method here is straightforward. Begin your mental walkthrough of your house. As you encounter each item, look at the next card from the shuffled deck and imagine the corresponding memorable person or thing doing something memorable near that item. For example, if the first item and location is the map in your front entry and the first card is the king of diamonds, you might picture Donald Trump wiping mud off of his expensive loafers on the entry mat in your front hallway. Proceed carefully through the rooms associating the proper mental images with objects in the proper order. After you complete a room, you might want to walk through it a few times in a row to lock in the imagery. Once you are done, you are ready to hand the deck to your friend and amaze him by rattling off the cards in order without picking. To do so, of course, simply requires that you perform the mental walkthrough one more time, connecting each memorable person or thing to its corresponding chord as you turn your attention to it. If you practice this technique, you will discover, like many mental athletes who came before you, that you can eventually internalize their whole deck in just minutes. More important than your ability to impress friends, of course, is the training such activities provide your mind. Proceeding through the steps described earlier requires that you focus your attention again and again on a clear target. Like a muscle responding to weights, this will strengthen your general ability to concentrate allowing you to go deeper with more ease. It's worth emphasizing, however, the obvious point that, that there is nothing special about card memorization. Any structured thought process that requires unwavering attention can have a similar effect, be it studying the Talmud like Adam Merlin from Rule No. 2's introduction, or practicing productive meditation or trying to learn the guitar part of a song by ear. If chord memorization seems weird to you, in other words, then choose a replacement that makes similar cognitive requirements. The key to this strategy is not the specific, but instead the motivating idea that your ability to concentrate is only as strong as your commitment to train it. Rule number three, quit social media. In 2013, author and digital media consultant Barajundi Thurston launched an experiment he decided to disconnect from his online life for 25 days, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Foursquare, not even email. He needed the break. Thurston, who is described by friends as the most connected man in the world, had by his own count participated in more than 59,000 Gmail conversations and posted 1,500 times on his Facebook wall in the year leading up to his experiment. I was burnt out, fried, done, toast, he explained. 
We know about Thurston's experiment because he wrote about it in a cover article for Fast Company magazine, ironically titled Unplug. As Thurston reveals in the article, it didn't take long to adjust to a disconnected life. By the end of that first week, the quiet rhythm of my days seemed far less strange, he said. I was less stressed about not knowing new things. I felt that I still existed despite not having shared documentary evidence of said existence on the internet. Thurston stuck up conversations with strangers. He enjoyed food without Instagramming the experience. He bought a bike. The end came too soon, Thurston lamented. But he had startups to run and books to market. So after the 25 days passed, he reluctantly reactivated his online presence. Baratunde Thurston's experiment neatly summarizes two important points about our culture's current relationship with social networks like Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and infotainment sites like Business Insider and BuzzFeed, two categories of online distraction that I will collectively call network tools in the pages ahead. The first point is that we increasingly recognize that these tools fragment our time and reduce our ability to concentrate. This reality no longer generates much debate we all feel it. This is the real problem for many different people. But the problem is especially dire if you are attempting to improve your ability to work deeply. In the preceding rule, for example, I described several strategies to help you sharpen your focus. These efforts will become significantly more difficult if you simultaneously behave like a pre-experiment Baraton Day Thurston, allowing your life outside such training to remain a distracted blur of apps and browser tabs. Willpower is limited, and therefore, the more enticing tools you have pulling at your attention, the order it will be to maintain focus on something important. To master the heart of deep work, therefore, you must take back control of your time and attention from the many diversions that attempt to steal them. Before we begin fighting back against these distractions, however, we must better understand the battlefield. This brings me to the second important point summarized by Baratunde Thurston's story, the importance with which knowledge workers currently discuss this problem of network tools and attention. Overwhelmed by these tools demands honest time, Thurston felt that his only option was to quit the internet altogether. This idea that a drastic internet sabbatical is the only alternative to the distraction generated by social media and infotainment has increasingly pervaded our cultural conversation. The problem with this binary response to this issue is that these two choices are much too crude to be useful. The notion that you would quit the internet is of course an overstuffed straw man, invisible for most. No one is meant to actually follow Baratunde Thurston's lead and this reality provides justification for remaining with the only offered alternative accepting our current distracted state as inevitable. For all the insight and clarity that Thurston gained during his internet sabbatical, for example, it didn't take him long once the experiment ended to slide back into the fragmented state where he began. On the day when I first started writing this chapter, which fell only six months after Thurston's article originally appeared in Fast Company, the reformed connector had already sent a dozen tweets in the few hours since we, he woke up. This rule attempts to break us out of this rut by proposing a third option. Accepting that these tools are not inherently heavy and that some of them might be quite vital to your success and happiness, but at the same time also accepting that the threshold for allowing a site regular access to your time and attention should be much more stringent and that most people should therefore be using many fewer such tools. I won't ask you, in other words, to quit the internet altogether like Baratun de Thurston did for 25 days back in 2013, but I will ask you to reject the state of distracted hyperconnectedness that drove him to that drastic experiment in the first place. There is a middle ground and if you are interested in developing a deep work habit, you must fight to get there. Our first step toward finding this middle ground in network tool selection is to understand the current default decision process deployed by most internet users. In the fall of 2013, I received insight into this process because of an article I wrote explaining why I never joined Facebook. 
Though the piece was meant to be explanatory and not accusatory, it nonetheless but many readers on the defensive, leading them to reply with justifications for their use of the service. Here are some examples of these justifications. Entertainment was my initial draw to Facebook. I can see what my friends are up to and post funny photos, make quick comments. When I first joined, I didn't know why, by mere curiosity, I joined a forum of short fiction stories. Once there, I improved my writing and made very good friends. I use Facebook because a lot of people I knew in high school are on there. Here's what strike me about this response. They are surprisingly minor. I don't doubt, for example, that the first commenter from this list finds some entertainment in using Facebook. But I would also assume that this person wasn't suffering some severe deficit of entertainment options before he or she signed up for the service. I would further wager that this user would succeed in staving off boredom even if the service were suddenly shut down. Facebook, at best, added one more entertainment option to many that already existed. Another commenter cited making friends in a writing forum. I don't doubt the existence of these friends, but we can assume that these friendships are lightweight, given that they are based on sending short messages back and forth over a computer network. There is nothing wrong with such lightweight friendships, but they are unlikely to be at the center of this user's social life. Something similar can be said about the commenter who reconnected with high school friends. This is a nice diversion but oddly something central to his or her sense of social connection or happiness. To be clear, I am not trying to denigrate the benefits identified previously. There is nothing illusory or misguided about them. When I am emphasizing, however, is that these benefits are minor and somewhat random. To this observation, you might reply that value is value. If you can find some extra benefit in using a service like Facebook, even if it's small, then why not use it? I call this way of thinking the any benefit mindset as it identifies any possible benefit as sufficient justification for using a network tool. In more detail, the any benefit approach to network tool selection. You are justified in using a network tool if you can identify any possible benefit to its use or anything you might possibly miss out on if you don't use it. The problem with this approach, of course, is that it ignores all the negatives that come along with the tools in question. These services are engineered to be addictive, robbing time and attention from activities that more directly support your professional and personal goals. Eventually, if you use these tools enough, you will arrive at the state of burned out, hyper distracted, connectivity that plagued Baratunde, Thurston, and millions of others like him. It's here that we encounter the true insidious nature of an any benefit mindset. The use of network tools can be harmful if you don't attempt to weigh pros against cons but instead use any glimpse of some potential benefit as justification for unrestrained use of a tool then you are unwittingly crippling your ability to succeed in the world of knowledge work. This conclusion, if considered objectively, shouldn't be surprising. In the context of network tools, we have become comfortable with the any benefit mindset, but if we instead zoom out and consider this mindset in the broader context of skilled labor, it suddenly seems a bizarre and a hysterical approach to choosing tools. In other words, once you put aside the revolutionary rhetoric surrounding all things internet, the saying summarized in part 1, that you are either fully committed to the revolution or a ludid karmajian, you will soon realize that network tools are not exceptional. They are tools, no different from a blacksmith's hammer or an artist's brush, used by skilled laborers to do their jobs better. Throughout history, skilled laborers have applied a sophistication and skepticism to their encounters with new tools and their decision about whether to adapt them. There is no reason why knowledge workers cannot do the same when it comes to the internet. The fact that the skilled labor here now involves digital bits doesn't change this reality. To help understand what this more careful tool curation might look like, it makes sense to start by talking to someone who makes a living working with tools and relies on complex relationship with these tools to succeed. Fortunately, for our purposes, I found just such an individual in a lanky English major turned successful, sustainable former 
named Forest Pritchard. Forest Pritchard runs Smith Meadows, a family farm located an hour west of D.C., one of many farms clustered in the valleys of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Soon after taking control of the land from his parents, as they learned, Pritchard moved the operation away from traditional monoculture crops and toward the then novel concept of grass finished meat. The farm bypasses wholesaling. You cannot find Smith Meadows steaks in Whole Foods to sell direct to customers at the bustling farmer's market in the Washington, D.C. metro area. By all accounts, the farm is thriving in an industry that rarely rewards small operations. I first encountered Pritchard at the our local farmer's market in Tacoma Park, Maryland, where the Smith Meadows stand does good business. To see Pritchard usually standing a foot taller than most of his suburbanite customers wearing the obligatory faded flannel of the former is to see a craftsman confident in his trade. I introduce myself to him because farming is a skill dependent on the careful management of tools and I wanted to understand how a craftsman in a non-digital field approaches this crucial task. Haymaking is a good example, he told me, not long into one of our conversations on the topic. It's a subject where I can give you the basic idea without having to gloss over the underlying economics. When Pritchard took over Smith Meadows, he explained, the farm made its own hay to use as animal feed during the winter months when grazing is impossible. Haymaking is done with a piece of equipment called a hay baler, a device you pull behind a tractor that compresses and binds dried grass into bales. If you raise animals on the East Coast, there is an obvious reason to own and operate a hay baler. Your animals need hay. Why spend money to buy in feed when you have the perfectly good grass growing for free right in your own soil? If a farmer subscribed to the any benefit approach used by knowledge workers, therefore you would definitely buy a hay baler. But, as Pritchard explained to me, if a farmer actually adapted such a simplistic mindset, I will be counting the days until the for sale sign goes up on the property. Pritchard, like most practitioners of his trade, instead deploys a more sophisticated thought process when assisting tools. And after applying this process to the hay baler, Pritchard was quick to sell it. Smith Meadows now purchases all the hay it uses. Here's why. Let's start by exploring the cost of making hay. Pritchard said, first, there is the actual cost of fuel and repairs and the shed to keep the baler. You also have to pay taxes on it. This directly measurable cost, however, were the easy part of his decision. It was instead the opportunities cost that required more attention. As he elaborated, if I make hay all summer, I cannot be doing something else. For example, I now use that time instead to raise broilers. This generates positive cash flow. Because I can sell them, but they also produce menu which I can then use to enhance my soil. Then there is the equally subtle issue of assessing the secondary value of your purchase to bale of hay. As Pritchard explained, when I am buying in a hay, I am trading cash for animal protein as well as manure. Which means I am also getting more nutrients for my land in exchange for my money. I am also avoiding compacting soils by driving heavy machinery over my ground all summer long. When making his final decision on the baler, Pritchard moved past the direct monetary cost which were essentially a wash and instead shifted his attention to the more nuanced issue of the long-term health of his fields. For the reason described previously, Pritchard concluded that buying in hay results in healthier fields and as he summarized, soil fertility is my baseline. By this calculation, the baler had to go. Notice the complexity of Pritchard's tool decision. This complexity underscores an important reality. The notion that identifying some benefits is sufficient to invest money, time and attention in a tool is near laughable to people in the street. Of course, Hay Baylor offers benefits. Every tool at the farm supply store has something useful to offer. At the same time, of course, it offers negatives as well. Pritchard expected this decision to be nonced. He began with a clear place line. In his case, that soil health is of fundamental importance to his professional success and then built off this foundation toward a final call on whether to use a particular tool. I propose that if you are a knowledge of worker, especially one interested in cultivating a deep oak habit, 
you should treat your tool selection with the same level of care as other skilled workers such as farmers following is my attempt to generalize this assessment strategy i call it the craftsman approach to tool selection a name that emphasizes that tools are ultimately aids to the larger goals of one's craft the craftsman approach to tool selection identify the core factors that determine success and happiness in your professional and personal life adopt a tool only if its positive impacts on this factor substantially outweigh its negative impacts notice that this craftsman's approach to tool selection stands in opposition to the any benefit approach where is the any benefit mindset identifies any potential positive impact as justification for using a tool the craftsman variant requires that this positive impacts affect factors at the core of what's important to you and that they outweighs the negatives even though the craftsman approach rejects the simplicity of the any benefit approach it doesn't ignore the benefits that currently drive people to network tools or make any advanced proclamations about what's good or bad technology it simply as that you give any particular network tool the same type of measured non accounting that tools in other trades have been subjected to throw the history of skilled labor the three strategies that follow in this rule are designed to grow your comfort with abandoning the any benefit mindset and instead applying the more thoughtful craftsman's philosophy in curating the tools that lay claim to your time and attention this guidance is important because the craftsman approach is not cut and dry identifying what matters most in your life and then attempting to assess the impacts of various tools on this factor doesn't reduce to a simple formula this task requires practice and experimentation the strategies that follow provide some structure for this practice and experimentation by forcing you to reconsider your network tools from many different angles combined they should help you cultivate a more sophisticated relationship with your tools that will allow you to take back enough control over your time and attention to enable the rest of the ideas in part 2 to, to succeed apply the law of the vital few to your internet habits malcolm gladwell doesn't use twitter in a 2013 interview he explained why who says my fans want to hear from me on twitter he then joked i know a lot of people would like to see less of me michael lewis another mega best selling author also doesn't use the service explaining in the wire i don't tweet i don't twitter i couldn't even tell you how to read or where to find a twitter message and as i mentioned in part 1 the award winning new yorker subscribe george packer also avoids the service and indeed only recently even succumbed to the necessity of owning a smartphone these three writers didn't don't think twitter is useless they are quick to accept that the other writers find it useful Packer's admission of non-Twitter use, in fact, was written as a response to an unabashedly pro-Twitter article by the late New York Times media critic David Carr, a piece in which Carr refused. And now, nearly a year, year later, as Twitter turned my brain to mush. No, I am a narrative on more things in a given moment than I ever thought possible, and instead of spending a half hour surfing in search of illumination, I get a sense of the day's news and how people are reacting to it in the time. that it takes to wait for coffee at starbucks at the same time however gladwell lewis and packer don't feel like the service offers them nearly enough advantage to offset its negative in their particular circumstances lewis for example worries that adding more accessibility will sap his energy and reduce his ability to research and write great stories noting it's amazing how overly accessible people are There is a lot of communication in my life that's not enriching; it's impoverishing. While Packer, for his part, worries about distraction, saying Twitter is crack for media studies. He goes so far as to describe Carr's rave about the service as the most frightening picture of the future that I have read thus far in the new decade. We don't have to argue about whether these authors are right in their personal decision to avoid Twitter. because their sales numbers and awards speaks for themselves we can instead use this decision as a courageous illustration of the craftsman approach to tool selection in action in a time when so many knowledge workers and especially those in creative fields are still trapped in the any benefit mindset it's refreshing to see a more mature approach to sorting through such services 
but the very rareness of this examples reminds us that mature and confident assessment of this type aren't easy to make recall the complexity of the thought process highlighted earlier that forest pritchard had to slog through to make a decision on his hay baler for many knowledge workers and many of the tools in their lives these decisions will be equally complex the goal of this strategy therefore is to offer some structure to this thought process a way to reduce some of the complexity of deciding which tools really matter to you the first step of this strategy is to identify the main high level goals in both your professional and your personal life if you have a family for example then your personal goals might involve parenting well and running an organized household in the professional sphere the details of these goals depend on what you do for a living in my own work as a professor for example i pursue two important goals one centered on being an effective teacher in the classroom and effective mentor to my graduate students and another centered on being an effective researcher while your goals will likely differ the key is to keep the list limited to what's most important and to keep the descriptions suitably high level when you're done you should have a small number of goals for both the personal and professional areas of your life once you have identified these goals list for each the two or three most important activities that help you satisfy the goal these activities should be specific enough to allow you to clearly picture doing them on the other hand they should be general enough that they are not tied to your one time outcome for example do better research is too general while finish paper on broadcast lawyer bounds in time for a com- upcoming conference submission is too specific a good activity in this context would be something like regularly read and understand the cutting edge results in my field the next step in this strategy is to consider the network tools you currently use for each such tool go through the key activities you identified and ask whether the use of the tool has a substantially positive impact a substantially negative impact or little impact on your regular and successful participation in the activity now comes the important decision keep using this tool only if you concluded that it has substantial positive impacts and that this outweigh the negative impacts to help illustrate this strategy in action let's consider a case study for the purpose of this example assume that michael lewis if asked would have produced the following goal and corresponding important activities for his writing career professional goal to craft well written narrative driven stories that change the way people understand the world key activities supporting this goal research passionately and deeply write carefully and with purpose now imagine that lewis was using this goal to determine whether or not to use twitter our strategy requires him to investigate twitter's impact on the key activities he listed that support his goal there is no con- convincing way to argue that twitter would make lewis substantially better at either of these activities deep research for lewis i assume requires him to spend weeks and months getting to know a small number of sources and careful writing of course requires freedom from distraction in both cases twitter at best has no real impact and at worst could be substantially negative depending on lewis susceptibility to the service addictive attributes the conclusion would therefore be that lewis shouldn't use twitter you might argue at this point that confining our example to this single goal is artificial as it ignores the areas where a service like twitter has its best chance of contributing for writers in particular Twitter is often presented as a tool to establish connection with your audience that ultimately lead to more sales. For a writer like Michael Lewis, however, marketing doesn't likely merit its own goal when he assesses what's important in his professional life. This follows because his reputation guarantees that he will receive massive coverage in massively influential media channels if the book is really good. His focus therefore is much more productively apply to the goal of writing the best possible book then instead trying to squeeze out a few extra sales through inefficient author driven means in other words the question is not whether twitter has some conceivable benefit of lewis it's instead whether twitter use significantly and positively affects the most important activities in his professional life what about a less famous writer in this case book marketing might play a more primary role in his or her goals but when forced to identify the two or three 
most important activity supporting this goal it's unlikely that the type of lightweight one on one contact enabled by twitter would make the list this is a result of simple math imagine that our hypothetical author diligently sends 10 individualized tweets a day 5 days a week each of which connects one on one with a new potential reader now imagine that 50% of the people contacted in this manner become loyal fans who will definitely buy the author's next book over the two year period it might take to write this book this yields 2000 sales a modest to boost at best in a marketplace where bestseller status requires two or three times more sales per week the question once again is not whether twitter offers some benefits but instead whether it offers enough benefits to offset its drag on your time and attention having seen an example of this approach applied to their professional context let's next consider the potentially more disruptive setting of personal goals in particular let's apply this approach to one of our culture's most ubiquitous and fiercely defended tools facebook when justifying the use of facebook most people cite its importance to their social lives with this in mind let's apply our strategy to understand whether facebook makes a cut due to its positive impact on this aspect of our personal goals to do so we will once again work with the hypothetical goal and key supporting activities personal goal to maintain close and rewarding friendships with a group of people who are important to me key activity supporting this goal regularly take the time for meaningful connection with those who are most important to me example long talk a meal joint activity two give of myself to those who are most important to me example making non trivial sacrifices that improve their lives not everyone will share this exact goal or supporting activities but hopefully you will stipulate that they apply to many people let's now step back and apply our strategies filtering logic to the example of facebook in the context of this personal goal this service of course offers any number of benefits to your social life to name a few that are often mentioned it allows you to catch up with the people you haven't seen in a while it allows you to maintain lightweight contact with people you know but don't run into regularly it allows you to more easily monitor important events in people lives and it allows you to stumble onto online communities or groups that match your interest these are real benefits that facebook undeniably offers but none of these benefits provide a significant positive impact to the two key activities we listed both of which are offline and effort intensive our strategy therefore would return a perhaps surprising but clear conclusion of course facebook offers benefits to your social life but none are important enough to what really matters to you in this area to justify giving it access to your time and attention to be clear i'm not arguing that everyone should stop using facebook i am instead showing that for this specific case study the strategy proposed here would suggest dropping this service i can imagine however other plausible scenarios that would lead to the opposite conclusion consider for example a college freshman for someone in this situation it might be more important to establish new friendships than to support existing friendships the activities this student identify for supporting his goal of a thriving social life therefore might include something like attend lots of events and socialize with lots of different people if this is a key activity and you are on a college campus then a tool like facebook would have a substantially positive impact and should be used to give another example consider someone in the military who has deployed overseas for this hypothetical soldier keeping in frequent lightweight touch with friends and family left back home is a plausible priority and one that might once again be best supported through social networks what should be clear from this example is that this strategy if applied as described will lead many people who currently use tools like facebook or twitter to abandon them but not everyone you might at this point complain about the arbitrariness of allowing only a small number of activities to dominate your decisions about such tools as we established previously for example facebook has many benefits to your social life why would one abandon it just because it doesn't happen to help the small number of activities that we judged most important What's key to understand here however is that this radical reduction of priorities is not arbitrary but is instead motivated by an idea 
that has arisen repeatedly in any number of different fields from client profitability to social equality to prevention of crashes in computer programmers the law of the vital few in many settings 80% of a given effect is due to just 20% of the plausible causes for example it might be the case that 80% of a business's profits came come from just 20% of its client 80% of nation's wealth is held by its richest 20% of citizens or 80% of computer software crashes come from just 20% of the identified bugs there is a formal mathematical underpinning to this phenomena but it's probably most useful when applied heuristically as a reminder that in many cases contribution to an outcome are not evenly distributed moving forward let's assume that this law holds for the important goals in your life as we noted many different activities can contribute to your achieving these goals the law of the vital few however reminds us that the most important 20% or so of these activities provide the bulk of the benefit assuming that you could probably list somewhere between 10 and 15 distinct and potentially beneficial activities for each of your life goals this law says that it's the top 2 or 3 such activities the number that this strategy ask you to focus on that make most of the differences in whether or not you succeed with the goal even if you accept this result however you still might argue that you shouldn't ignore the other 80% of possible beneficial activities it's true that this less important activities don't contribute nearly as much to your goal as your top one or two but they can provide some benefit so why not keep them in the mix as long as you don't ignore the most important activities it seems like it cannot hurt to also support some of the less important alternatives this argument however misses the key point that all activities regardless of their importance consume your same limited store of time and attention if you service low impact activities therefore you are taking away time you could be spending on higher impact activities it's a zero sum game and because your time return substantially more rewards when invested in high impact activities than when invested in low impact activities the more of it you shift to the later the lower your overall benefit the business world understand this math this is why it's not uncommon to see a company fire unproductive clients if 80% of their profits come from 20% of their clients then they make more money by redirecting the energy from low revenue clients to better service the small number of lucrative contracts each hour spent on the latter returns more revenue than each hour spent on the former the same holds true for your professional and personal goals by taking the time consumed by low impact activities like finding old friends on facebook and reinvesting in high impact activities like taking a good friend out to lunch you end up more successful in your goal to abandon a network tool using this logic therefore is not to miss out on its potential small benefits but is instead to get more out of the activities you already know to yield large benefits to return to where we started for malcolm gladwell michael levis and george packer to the distance support the 20% of activities that generate the bulk of the success in their writing careers even though in isolation this service might return some minor benefits when their careers are viewed as a whole they are likely more successful not using twitter and redirecting that time to more fruitful activities than if they added it to into their schedule as one more thing to manage you should take the same care in deciding which tools you allow to claim your own limited time and attention fit social media When Ryan Nicodemus decided to simplify his life, one of his first targets was his possessions. At the time, Ryan lived alone in a spacious three-bedroom condo. For years, driven by a consumerist impulse, he had been trying his best to fill this ample space. Now it was time to reclaim his life from his stuff. The strategy he deployed was simple to describe, but radical in concept. He spent an afternoon packing everything he owned into cardboard boxes as if he was about to move. In order to transform what he described as a difficult undertaking into something less onerous, he called it a packing party, explaining everything's more exciting when it's a party, right? Once the packing was done, Nicodemus then spent the next week going through his normal routine. 
if he needed something that was packed you would unpack it and put it back where it used to go at the end of the week he noticed that the vast majority of his stuff remained untouched in its boxes so he got rid of it stuff accumulates in people's life in part because when faced with a specific act of elimination it's easy to worry what if i need this one day and then use this worry as an excuse to keep the item in question sitting around nicodemus packing party provided him with definitive evidence that most of his stuff was not something he needed and it therefore supported his quest to simplify the last strategy provided a systematic method to help you begin sorting through the network tools that currently lay claim to your time and attention this strategy offers you a different but complementary approach to this same issues and it's inspired by rayon nicole dumas approach to getting rid of his useless stuff in more detail this strategy asks that you perform the equivalent of your packing party on your social media service that you currently use instead of packing however you will instead ban yourself from using them for 30 days all of them facebook instagram google plus twitter snapchat vine or whatever other services have risen to popularity since i first wrote this words don't formally de- deactivate these services and don't mention online that you will be signing off just stop using them cold turkey if someone reaches out to you by other means and ask why your activity on a particular service has fallen off you can explain but don't go out of your way to tell people after 30 days of this self imposed network isolation ask yourself the following two questions about each of the services you temporarily quit number 1 would the last 30 days have been notably better if i had been able to use this service number 2 Did people care that I wasn't using this service? If your answer is no to both questions, quit the service permanently. If your answer was a clear yes, then return to using the service. If your answers are qualified or ambiguous, it's up to you whether you return to the service. So I would encourage you to lean toward quitting. This strategy picks specifically on social media because among the different network tools that can claim your time and attention, These services, if used without limit, can be particularly devastating to your quest to work deeper. They offer personalized information arriving on an unpredictable intermittent schedule, making them massively addictive and therefore capable of severely damaging your attempts to schedule and succeed with any act of concentration. Given these dangers, you might expect that more knowledge workers would avoid this tool altogether. especially those like computer programmers or writers whose livelihoods explicitly depends on the outcome of deep work but part of what makes social media insidious is that the companies that profit from your attention have succeeded with masterful marketing coup convincing our culture that if you don't use their products you might miss out this fear that you might miss out as obvious parallels to the decodomus fear that the voluminous stuff in his closets might one day prove useful which is why i am suggesting a corrective strategy that parallels is packing party by spending a month without these services you can replace your fear that you might miss out on events on conversations on shared cultural experiences with a dose of reality for most people this reality will confirm something that seems obvious only once you have done the odd work of freeing yourself from the marketing messages surrounding these tools They are not really all that important in your life. The reason why I ask you to not announce your 30-day experiment is because for some people, another part of the delusion that binds them to social media is the idea that people want to hear what you have to say and that they might be disappointed if you suddenly leave them bereft of your commentary. I'm being somewhat facetious here in my wording but this underlying sentiment is nonetheless common and important to take up. As of this writing for example the average number of followers for a Twitter user is 208. When you know that more than 200 people volunteer to hear what you have to say it's easy to begin to believe that your activities on this services are important. Speaking from experience as someone who makes a living trying to sell my ideas to people this is a powerfully addictive feeling but here's the reality of audience in the social media era before the services existed building an audience of any size behind your immediate friends and family required odd competitive work in the early 2000s 
For example, anyone could start a blog, but to gain even just a handful of unique visitors per month required that you actually put in the work to deliver information that's valuable enough to capture someone's attention. I know this difficulty well. My first blog was started in the fall of 2003. It was called Cleverly Enough Inspiring Monikier. I used it to muse on my life as a 21-year-old college student. They were, I am embarrassed to admit, long stretches where no one read it. As I learned in the decade that followed, a period in which I passionately and painstakingly built an audience for my current blog, Study Hakes, from a handful of readers to hundreds of thousands per month, is that earning people's attention online is odd, odd work. Except now, it's not. Part of what fueled social media's rapid ascent I contend is its ability to short-circuit this connection between the hard work of producing real value and the positive reward of having people pay attention to you. It has instead replaced this timeless capitalist exchange with a shallow collectivist alternative. I'll pay attention to what you say if you pay attention to what I say, regardless of its value. A blog or magazine or television program that contains the content that typically populates a Facebook wall or Twitter feed, for example, would attract on average no audience. But when captured within the social conventions of these services, that same content will attract attention in the form of likes and comments. The implicit agreement motivating this behavior is that in return for receiving attention from your friends and followers, you will return the favor by lavishing attention on them. You like my status update and I will like yours. This agreement gives everyone a simulacrum of importance without requiring much effort in return. By dropping off these services without notice, you can taste the reality of your status as a content producer. For most people and most services, the news might be sobering. No one outside your closest friends and family will likely even notice you have signed off. I recognize that I come across as karma only when talking about this issue. Is there any other way to tackle it? But it's important to discuss because this quest for self-importance plays an important role in convincing people to continue to thoughtlessly fragment their time and attention. For some people, of course, this 30-day experiment will be difficult and generate lots of issues. If you are a college student or online personality, for example, the abstention will complicate your life and will be noted. But for most, I suspect the net result of this experiment, if not a massive overall in your internet habits, will be a more grounded view of the role social media plays in your daily existence. These services aren't necessarily as advertised the lifeblood of our modern connected world. They are just products developed by private companies, funded lavishly, marketed carefully, and designed ultimately to capture then sell your personal information and attention to advertisers. They can be fun, but in the scheme of your life and what you want to accomplish, they are a lightweight whimsy, one unimportant distraction among many threatening to derail you from something deeper. Or maybe social media tools are at the core of your existence. You won't know either way until you sample life without them. Don't use the internet to entertain yourself. Harlow Bennett was an English writer born near the turn of the 20th century, yet tumultuous time for his own country's economy. The Industrial Revolution, which had been roaring for decades by this point, had wrenched enough surplus capital from the empire's resources to generate a new class, the white-collar worker. It was now possible to have a job in which you spent a set number of hours a week in an office and in exchange received a steady salary sufficient to support a household. Such a lifestyle is blandly familiar in our current age, but to Bennett and his contemporaries, it was novel and in many ways distressing. Chief among Bennett's concern was that members of this new class were missing out on the opportunities it presented to live a full life. Take the case of a Londoner who works in an office whose office hours are from 10 to 6 and who spends 50 minutes morning and night in travelling between his house door and his office door. Bennett writes in his 1910 self-help classic, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. This hypothetical London salaryman, he notes, has a little more than 16 hours left in the day behind this work-related hours. To Bennett, this is a lot of time, but most people in this situation tragically don't realize its potential. 
the great and profound mistake which my typical man makes in regard to his day he elaborates is that even though he doesn't particularly enjoy his work he persists in looking upon those hours from 10 to 6 as the day to which the 10 hours preceding them and the 6 hours following them are nothing but a prologue and epilogue this is an attitude that bennett condemns as utterly illogical and unhealthy what's the alternative to this state of affairs Bennett suggests that this is typical man sees 16 free hours as a day within a day, explaining during those 16 hours is free, is not a wage earner, is not preoccupied with monetary cash, is just as good as a man with a private income. Accordingly, the typical man should instead use this time as an aristocrat would to perform rigorous self-improvement, a task that, according to Bennett, involves primarily reading great literature and poetry. Bennett wrote about these issues more than a century ago. You might expect that in the intervening decades, a period in which this middle class exploded in size worldwide, our thinking about leisure time would have evolved. But it has not. If anything, with the rise of the internet and a low bro attention economy it supports, the average 40 hour a week employee, especially those in my tech savvy millennial generation has seen the quality of his or her leisure time remain degraded, consisting primarily of a blur of distracted clicks on least common denominator digital entertainment. If Bennett were brought back to life today, you would likely fall into despair at the lack of progress in this area of human development. To be clear, I am indifferent to the moral up underpinnings behind Bennett's suggestions. His vision of elevating the souls and minds of the middle class by reading poetry and great books feels somewhat antiquated and classist, but the logical foundation of his proposal that you both should and can make deliberate use of your time outside work remains relevant today, especially with respect to the goal of his rule, which is to reduce the impact of network tools on your ability to perform deep work. In more detail, in the strategies discussed so far in this rule, we haven't spent much time yet on a class of network tools that are particularly relevant to the fight for depth. Entertainment-focused websites designed to capture and hold your attention for as long as possible. At the time of this writing, the most popular examples of such sites include the Uffington Post, BuzzFeed, Business Insider and Reddit. This list will undoubtedly continue to evolve, but what this general category of sites shares is the use of carefully crafted titles and easily digestible content, often owned by algorithms to be maximally attention-catching. Once you have landed on one article in one of the sites, links on the side or bottom of the page should beckon you to click on another, then another. Every available trick of human psychology from listing titles as popular or trending to the use of arresting photos uh, is used to keep you engaged. At this particular moment, for example, some of the most popular articles on BuzzFeed include 17 words that mean something totally different when spelled backward, and 33 dogs winning at everything. These sites are especially harmful after the workday is over, where the freedom is in, in your schedule enables them to become central to your leisure time. If you are waiting in line or waiting for the plot to pick up in a TV show or waiting to finish eating a meal, they provide a cognitive crutch to ensure you eliminate any chance of boredom. As I argued in rule number two, however, such behavior is dangerous as it weakens your mind's general ability to resist distraction, making deep work difficult later when you really want to concentrate. To make matters worse, these network tools are not something you join and therefore they are not something you can remove from your life by quitting. They are always available. Just a quick click away. Fortunately, Arnold Bennett identified the solution to this problem a hundred years earlier. Put more thought into your leisure time. In other words, this strategy suggests that when it comes to your relaxation, don't default to whatever catches your attention at the moment, but instead dedicate some advanced thinking to the question of how you want to spend your day within a day. Added to websites of the type mentioned previously thrive in a vacuum. If you haven't given yourself something to do in a given moment, they will always beckon as an appealing option. If you instead fill this free time with something of more quality, their grip on your attention will loosen. It's crucial, therefore, that you figure out in advance what you are going to do with your evenings and weekends before they begin. 
structured hobbies provide good fodder for these hours as they generate specific actions with specific goals to fill your time. A set program of reading where you spend regular time each night making progress on a series of deliberately chosen books is also a good option as is of course exercise or the enjoyment of good company. In my own life, for example, I managed to read a surprising number of books in a typical year given the demands on my time as a professor, writer and father. This is possible because one of my favorite pre-planned leisure activities after my kids bedtime is to read an interesting book. As a result, my smartphone and computer and the distractions they can offer typically remain neglected between the end of the workday and the next morning. At this point, you might worry that adding such structure to your relaxation will defeat the purpose of relaxing, which many believe requires complete freedom from plans or obligations. Won't a structured evening leave you exhausted, not refreshed to the next day at work? Bennett, to his credit, anticipated this complaint, as he argues such worries misunderstand what energizes the human spirit. What? You say that full energy given to those 60 numbers will lessen the value of the business 8? Not so. On the contrary, it will assuredly increase the value of the business 8. One of the chief things uh, which my typical man has to learn is that the mental faculties are capable of a continuous odd activity. They do not tire like a, an arm or a leg. All they want is change, not rest, except in sleep. In my experience, this analysis is spot on. If you give your mind something meaningful to do throughout all your waking hours, you will end the day more fulfilled and begin the next one more relaxed. Then, if you instead allow your mind to bathe for hours in semi-conscious and unstructured web surfing. To summarize, if you want to eliminate the addictive pull of entertainment sites on your time and attention, give your brain a quality alternative. Not only will this preserve your ability to resist distraction and concentration, but you might even fulfill Arnold Bennett's ambitious goal of experiencing perhaps for the first time what it means to live and not just exist.